challenge my friend because I'll be the, the one who gets the super serve. Oh, you get Fall from some stain fall. All right, if you don't mind, uh, if you could please take your seat. We're going to go ahead and get started with tonight's program. All right, uh, good afternoon. My name is Juan Rivera. I'm the airport director here at Manassas Regional Airport, and I will be the moderator uh, tonight uh, for this uh, seminar. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, this is a uh, first time that we've actually held a seminar at the airport, and I hope that uh, this one will be successful and, and maybe we can have some more in the future. Uh, I would certainly want to hear any feedback that you may have, uh, whether it's a particular topic that you would want to hear in the future, and we can certainly host it here at our venue uh, in the terminal building. I think tonight, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about and we'll just be touching on uh, probably the tip of the iceberg when it comes to advanced air mobility. Uh, so we have some uh, distinguished guests with us tonight. Uh, who know a lot more about this topic uh, than I do and probably have forgotten more than I'll ever know about the topic. But uh, it's something that, uh, you know, this new technology, the advanced air mobility system itself uh, is here. It's here to stay, and uh, it will hopefully uh, be coming to our community soon. So many transportation experts have predicted that the advent of drones or what is sometimes called unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs, and electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, or better known as ETOL aircraft, will fundamentally change the way we transport people in cargo. Tonight, our panel will talk about the many facets of air advanced air mobility. Each member of our panel will bring their own perspective on what they see for the future of moving people in cargo between places that are not currently or easily served by surface transportation or existing aviation modes. Uh, with the development of infrastructure in support of AAM already underway in many cities throughout the country, AAM is expected to become an important part of our national transportation system. It is imperative that our community work together with local policymakers, regional planners, universities, state and federal agencies, and the aviation industry as a whole in the upcoming years to position ourselves to take advantage of these new technologies. By planning for what is on the horizon, we can open the doors for increased economic prosperity for our community. Tonight, I will follow the typical panel discussion. Each one of our guests will make their presentation, which will be followed after everyone is done with Q&A. So our first speaker for tonight is Mr. Greg Campbell, who is the Director of Aviation for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Greg was named Director of Aviation uh, effective February 14th of 2022 uh, prior to that was he was appointed by our governor uh, prior to being appointed uh, as director of aviation Greg was the executive director of the Shenandoah Valley Regional Airport a position he held for 30 years as director Greg oversees a team of 35 professionals who grow 
who grow the local communities throughout economic development, serves 66 public use airports across the Commonwealth, and supports an industry of $22.9 billion uh, in the aviation industry in Virginia. Greg has served on the boards of Governors Aerospace Advisory Council, the Virginia Commercial Space Authority, the Virginia Resource Authority, the Washington Airports Task Force, the Small Aircraft Transportation System Lab, and the Virginia Aeronautical Historical Society. He's also a certified American Association Airport Executive and past president of the Virginia Airport Operators Council. He is president of the Greater Augusta Regional Chamber of Commerce and former chairman of the uh, Shenandoah Valley Partnership. Uh, he also serves on the member of the Go Virginia Region 8. He was named airport manager of, year, of the year in 1996 and was selected as aviation person of the year in 2012. He received his uh, James Madison University Public Servant Award in 2013, and he earned his bachelor's degree in political science from Bridgewater College. I have known Greg as long as I have been in Virginia aviation for 30 years. I could say that we probably grew up together in aviation. Uh, I think he's probably got some stories that we could only talk about over a beer. Uh, but I'm proud to introduce Greg. He's a great friend of not only uh, airports and pilots in the Commonwealth, but he's a great friend of mine. Greg. Thank you, Juan. And uh, it's great to be in Manassas and great to visit this airport, uh, which is a tremendous asset, not only just to the city of Manassas, but the, the surrounding jurisdictions and it's a critical part of the Commonwealth's aviation system of airports. Um, over the years, the Department of Aviation and the Virginia Aviation Board have partnered with the airport and the city to help develop this facility, and it's really become a premier facility that provides measurable economic uh, benefits to the region. I want to commend Juan, the city, and their staff, uh, and the whole team here on their steadfast pursuits uh, to constantly improve and expand and evolve the airport's capabilities and services. Uh, under Juan's leadership, Manassas has always been a leader uh, with a vision for the future, not just meeting today's aviation needs for the community and the region, uh, but also the opportunities that lie ahead as well. As a former airport director and as Juan mentioned, colleague of his, I can tell you that he always has an eye to the future. We've had many conversations about this over the years, and it's his leadership it's not just been apparent here at Manassas, but throughout the state. And this forum tonight is an example of that. Uh, this is the first of its kind in the state. And we applaud this effort and vision to bring everyone together about this important topic, which really can be transformational for the Commonwealth and its citizens. We all really need to work together collaboratively and collectively to integrate these new technologies into our aviation system. And we need to do so in a safe and efficient manner. Virginia has established itself as a leader over the years in aviation with their aviation system. Facilities like this here in Manassas uh, really, really put Virginia out front and give us a big economic development advantage, frankly, uh, when it comes to uh, our airports and what they provide and the access they provide to our communities and that they do such a good job. Um, having established ourselves as a leader in aviation with our system, uh, we also our goal is to maintain that leadership role as it relates to UAS and aviation technology, AAM, and that entire space. Uh, tonight you'll hear from Dr. Amber Wilson. She's the Department of Aviation's Manager of Technology about our initiatives, the innovation, and the collaboration that is occurring. Also, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the commitment that we have and their participation tonight from our friends from the Virginia Innovation Partnership Corporation and their Unmanned Systems Center. Tracy Tynan is here, along with Tom McMahon. We appreciate you being here. These are the folks that are really driving a lot of the innovation in terms of technology and implementation of that technology and, uh, and, and pilot programs to, to, to prove it out. Our side on the Department of Aviation is really focused on airport infrastructure and uh, the regulatory environment and what we need to do to help facilitate the growth of this segment. And again, make sure that Virginia leads in this, in this space. 
So our goal is not just to be ready for these advances in aviation, but to remain a leader and create opportunities for our citizens and businesses in the Commonwealth to benefit from these exciting new technologies. As Juan mentioned, uh, we feel that this can be transformational. And this is an exciting era that we're entering into. It's a dynamic era. And I think we're going to see some really interesting things over the next decade. And I'm excited to be a part of it. I hope you are too. I wanted to thank each of you for being here tonight. Uh, it's, it's really important that the communities seek to understand aviation and all it brings to a community and, and work collaboratively to position yourselves uh, to benefit from it. So thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. And we look forward to working with your community and the airport leadership here uh, to make sure that, that this airport remains a strong economic development tool and asset for the region. And with that, uh, I will uh, turn things over to Dr. Amber Wilson, the Department of Aviation's uh, Technology Manager. Are you going to do an introduction? Yes. Thank you. Just a minor change. We're going to have Dr. Uh, Michael Patterson from NASA uh, speak first. Michael, uh, I had an opportunity to listen to him speak uh, at a conference uh, not too long ago. Uh, outstanding information and great overview of uh, AAM. And just a little bit about Dr. Patterson. He's an aerospace engineer in the Aeronautical Systems Analysis Branch at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. He serves as the lead for Emerging Application and Technologies Group. He earned a BS in aerospace engineering from Auburn University and holds an MS and a PhD degree in aerospace engineering from Georgia Tech. Uh, Dr. Patterson has been a thought leader in NASA's advanced air mobility work and currently works for NASA's AAM Mission and Integration Office at the Systems Analyst and ConOps Lead. So Dr. Patterson was not able to be with us uh, physically here, but he is joining us uh, via Zoom tonight. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to him. Uh, Dr. Patterson, uh, can you hear me? Yep, I've got your one. Can you all hear me all right? Yes, thank you. Go ahead. All right. Well, uh, many thanks uh, for having me out, <laughs> even in a, a virtual format. So I I'm apologize I wasn't able to make it out there in person. Uh, kind of a, a crazy time, but I think it will always be a crazy time for the at least the foreseeable future on this front. Uh, lots of exciting stuff happening, and I'm, I'm excited to, to talk with you all a little bit today uh, about advanced air mobility. Uh, just you know, quick quick background. I appreciate the the introduction Juan gave. Uh, the office that I, I sit in currently at NASA is kind of in charge of some of the overall strategy uh, for NASA's research in the space, uh, the advanced air mobility space, I should say. Uh, and uh, a lot of my colleagues are are based out of the D.C. area, but a lot of travel and other things with the July Fourth holiday. So only one of them was able to make it. Uh, Lexi Brown. Our business analyst is is out there in the audience. So, Lexi, if you want to wave, I can't see if you're waving. So I, I don't know if you're actually doing it or not. But uh, say, say hey to Lexi if you want. Uh, and uh, feel free to reach out to her uh, or me. Um, we're happy to, to answer questions after the fact. Um, <clears throat> so today, uh, kind of where, where we're going with things. Um, hopefully the slide's changing. Yes, all right, good. Um, Start with kind of an overview of advanced air mobility, just just how we talk about it at NASA, and I'll, I'll just say right up front, it's an evolving space, so uh, still still a, a work of art in progress, so to speak, uh, which we'll talk more about in a moment. Uh, talk with you some about sustainability considerations. Uh, certainly, sustainability is a, a very important aspect uh, of making anything new happen, um, and it's becoming just increasingly important in our world today. Uh, then kind of talk more, uh, trying to bring it into the the airport community more. Uh, so so try to focus on you all who are, are part of the airport community and, and the things you can be thinking about uh, to help help ready, uh, you know, Manassas Regional Airport as well as other airports uh, that, that you may be engaged engaged with uh, across the Commonwealth and otherwise uh, to to accept these new technologies and then kind of close out with some some summary thoughts. So. I always like to mention up front, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw out some viewpoints here. Um, and particularly as we get to the questions, you're, you're going to hear Michael Patterson's uh, thoughts and opinions. Uh, they, they're not 
particularly those of the, the U.S. government, and in particular in this space with how much is, is evolving and changing so rapidly, uh, you know, I, I may even change my mind uh, in a few days' time <laughs> on some of them, depending on how things go. Uh, but uh, so anyway, uh, just uh, take that, uh, the, the things that I say particularly in my comments, just, just as my own, and uh, happy to have further discussion with you after the fact here tonight even. Uh, so starting with an overview of advanced chair mobility, uh, we, we like to throw out this graphic, we call it an OV1, uh, just to kind of give some flavor for the sorts of missions uh, that we're talking about in the advanced air mobility space. Uh, so while, while you're you know, kind of taking in all the, the lines across the screen and, and the different types of aircraft that you see and the different descriptions of the missions, very short um, descriptions that is, at, at the bottom, we've got our, our definition of AAM. So safe, sustainable, affordable, and accessible aviation for transformational, local, and intra-regional missions. Now that's a mouthful. Um, I freely admit that it's a mouthful. Uh, zooming in kind of on, on the last part of that statement, right? Local and intra-regional missions, right? Really the emphasis of that is that uh, these new technologies that are coming along are really enabling aviation to be used for shorter range missions than it typically has been. And specifically thinking of the commercial hub and spoke kind of air transport system, you know, once you get above the 500 mile mark, it really starts to do pretty well. Um, but I, I think a lot of you uh, and more of the general aviation community probably don't often fly that far and, and you're able to leverage the, the great network of airports that we have in the US uh, and in the, in the Commonwealth specifically, um, in, including the Manassas Airport uh, to, to jump around for shorter distances and, and make uh, practical travel for yourselves. Um, that's not really a, a generally accessible thing uh, for a lot of people today. And so one of the visions here of, of advanced air mobility is really bringing aviation to bear uh, for those shorter range missions than it typically has been. And these could be super short missions, right? On the order of, uh, you know, just a couple miles down the street, even if you're thinking about some sort of package delivery drone as an example, uh, where it may be able to come into people's lives. Um, so intra-regional, just trying to emphasize with that word that these are shorter range missions uh, within a region, really not, not so much flying you know, between reason, regions or across the country. And local, emphasizing that there are applications uh, that are strictly within a, a local metropolitan area. Transformational is another key word there, right? So this is not just business as usual um, sort of stuff to fit the advanced air mobility moniker. Uh, there's got to be some sort of a, a step change, some sort of new capability that really opens up um, aviation in, in a way that it hasn't exactly been before. Uh, or if there's, you know, some existing missions that have maybe been in that space, it, it just can ramp up the number of those in a significant way. And then the adjectives at the beginning, uh, safe, sustainable, affordable, and accessible, you could probably throw another 10 or 20 different adjectives there. Um, that, that could describe what these missions are, but generally getting at the, the point that these capabilities that we're talking about are things that the average citizen can expect uh, to be able to utilize on a relatively regular basis. You know, not, not the typical aviation experience of the general public, which is often, you know, going to an airport once or twice a year, a major hub airport and sitting through security lines forever and, you know, flying across the country. Um, so lots of different different missions depicted on this chart, um, which I, I won't, won't go through them all, uh, but I'll, I'll try to highlight some of the key points here on, on the next slide. Uh, and if you kind of think about uh, AAM as a whole, I like to kind of talk about it as bringing aviation into people's daily lives, right? Uh, and if not daily lives, maybe you know weekly or monthly, just kind of within the regular cadence of people's lives. And really what's, what's at the heart driving a lot of this right now are, are a few underlying technologies, probably most prominently increasing degrees of electrification uh, as well as increasing degrees of automation. So electrification that, that could be a fully electric aircraft uh, as, as many are proposing, but there's also possibilities there for uh, some sort of hybrid electric aircraft, uh, turbo electric and maybe hydrogen and other things coming into play. Uh, to potentially open up uh, and revolutionize the way we design aircraft, which can revolutionize, therefore, the, the costs uh, to operate those aircraft. Uh, that, that can be a big step change. And the other big piece is the automation. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of aircraft are, are very, very highly automated, particularly compared to our, our cars that we're used to driving around. Uh, but, you know, this is taking it <clears throat> to the next level beyond that. So, 
you know, eventually, you know, at some point in the future, getting towards, you know, self-flying aircraft. But in the near term, thinking of automation as an assistive technology to come in and, and help pilots and, and help people to become pilots, perhaps without even requiring as much training, uh, while still maintaining the same or even a higher level of safety than we've seen in the past. Uh, we kind of split up, so these, these technologies can really driving three primary applications uh, that we say underneath the AM umbrella. So the first being urban air mobility or UAM. Uh, the second being what we've started calling low altitude mobility. Uh, you also see a lot of things uh, talking about small air uh, unmanned aerial systems, uh, small UAS or uh, perhaps uh, UTM, so uh, UAS traffic management. All, all those acronyms are, are kind of hitting the same thing. And then the third being regional air mobility, uh, or what's sometimes called RAM. So starting with urban air mobility, this has been uh, really what's what's popularized, I think, the advanced air mobility space and media has latched on to a lot of these flying car concepts. Um, and as Juan mentioned to you, a, a lot of these are electric vertical takeoff and landing or eVTOL aircraft that, that people are talking about using for these short range trips. So this is, you know, flying across town, right? So maybe from one side of DC to the other, as an example. Uh, hard to put an upper limit on, on the range here. Something in the 50 to 75 mile <clears throat> range is, is kind of the, the upper end of what most people are talking about under urban air mobility. And most talk about utilizing a, a novel vertiport infrastructure for these eVTOL EV aircraft. Uh, but also within this space, there's certainly potential for, for existing airports to play a large role. Um, and those, those could be landing points for eVTOL aircraft. You'll even see a lot of the eVTOL companies out there uh, proposing to start from airports in their early networks, right? So I think Manassas and, and other places have an interesting case um, for being some of the early adopter points uh, for even those aircraft. But even more prominently perhaps than that would be be novel short takeoff and landing. So uh, eSTOL there, electric short takeoff and landing or eCTOL, electric conventional takeoff and landing sort of aircraft. Um, where airports or, or other small landing strips are, are positioned effectively around a metropolitan area to still enable that <clears throat> shorter range transportation. Generally, these are smaller aircraft, two to six passengers, I'd say, are equivalent cargo size um, is kind of the sweet spot that, that most people are talking about and a little bit uh, fuzzy on the upper and lower ends, but that, that's where most of them end up being. And there's also some talk of, of using these aircraft for cargo, although most of what you see uh, in the urban air mobility space is really focused on uh, passenger movement. <clears throat> uh, so second here, low altitude mobility. These are really leveraging those, those small UAS, which I, I think uh, Dr. Wilson will be talking with you after me here a little bit more about uh, some of the early efforts on this front. Uh, but these are the sort of <clears throat> local missions for things like food delivery or small package delivery or infrastructure inspection uh, that, that you see people talking about. Uh, some of those missions are happening now and some can happen in uh, the near future. There's kind of a, a range of aircraft designs out there for this space. Um, really no, no one, one design you can point to here, uh, but often they are small unmanned aircraft systems, meaning less than 55 pounds in gross weight, but certainly not all of them are that people are proposing. Um, and often these have vertical takeoff and landing capability, but again, there's there's some other concepts out there that, that don't necessarily have that within them. And then <clears throat> the final flavor here, regional air mobility. This is really looking to leverage uh, existing airport infrastructure, particularly you know non-hub infrastructure, I'll say, smaller airports, regional airports such as Manassas, and then other totally uncontrolled fields as well. Um, these are those trips of you know maybe 100 to 500-ish miles. Um, and primarily looking to leverage uh, novel electric conventional takeoff and landing or uh, short takeoff and landing aircraft. Uh, sizes here vary a little bit more. I, I think there's, there's still uh, some figuring out of where the sweet spot is in this space, but you see anything from a few passengers up to about 19 passengers. I, I think something in the six to nine passengers is probably where the sweet spot's gonna come out, uh, at least in the nearer term with the way some of the technologies are playing out, but we'll, we'll see how, it, how the, the cookie crumbles there. And I think you also see in this space a lot more of cargo uh, logistics being talked about. Um, a lot of potential there for, for replacing uh, existing, say, Cessna caravans or other things that uh, a lot of the big shipping companies like the FedEx and UPSs of the world use uh, to move some of their cargo around. So lots of opportunity there um, <clears throat> for, for new, new technologies to come into the space. Um, and lots of different applications. 
applications. I, I think I've mentioned most of those, but that um, <clears throat> if you want to trace the history back, it, it's a little hard to pinpoint how far back to go. Uh, you, you could go very far back to the early days of aviation, people talking about having their own private flying car uh, type of thing. But I, I really think a, a lot of the genesis uh, of where we are today can be traced back to the early 2000s. Um, NASA had a few programs, uh, SATs and Agate, and I think uh, Greg Campbell there was uh, involved with one of the SATS labs that grew out of that SATS program. So that's, that's a cool, uh, cool connection there. Um, and certainly the regional air mobility space that, that's evolving now is, can be traced very strongly back, back to those uh, developments in the early 2000s. Uh, by the approaching the 2010 kind of time frame, uh, you, you start to see the electric propulsion side come along. And I, I think the, uh, the Puffin, which is this uh, kind of aircraft, hopefully you can see my mouse, um, <clears throat> Just underneath the, the timeline there was, as far as I know, the first electric uh, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft design uh, thrown out there, uh, which now there's you know, hundreds of them uh, being postulated. And uh, really this, this pathway that kind of on the bottom here calling the, the GA or general aviation pathway as kind of being one of the, the main thrusts of the community um, that, that's evolved into what is called advanced air mobility. And around that kind of 2010 stand, uh, time point time frame, um, you began to also see the unmanned aerial systems uh, or UAS can be really start to come along in the civil space. It had certainly been pretty prominent in the uh, military space prior to that, to the airspace. And I, I think these two communities really, you know, kind of started on these separate tracks and it really began to converge, maybe starting around the, the mid 2010s, if you will. Uh, with some different aircraft concepts uh, that, that you kind of see in the middle of the timeline uh, that, that kind of fused elements of them together. And now you, you've got people in the advanced air mobility space coming from both of these communities. Uh, I won't hit all the details of the, the timelines on both sides, but I, you know, we've, we've seen the electric propulsion technologies really evolve on the, the general aviation side um, in 2011 with the Green Flight Challenge and, and other developments uh, more recently than that. And those kind of coalesce with uh, a lot of the, the boom in the, the small UAS community in particular that, that occurred when the uh, UTM uh, architecture and uh, the development of that uh, UAS traffic management const construct came out uh, that, that really opened up, hey, the, the pathway to get in the air uh, for these small unmanned aerial systems. Um, and, uh, you know, those kind of two communities are now, now converging and you see a lot of concepts cross-pollinating between them uh, that, that's really uh, emerged into what we call the advanced air mobility space now. <clears throat> so shifting gears a little bit here, I wanna, wanna talk about sustainability. Um, so first of all, what is sustainability? It's, uh, I think a lot of people mean some different things when they say it, uh, probably the most definitive source is uh, uh, the Brundtland Commission, uh, the, the UN Commission back in the late 1980s. Um, and just a direct quote from that, they're talking about sustainable development there, but. Uh, you can really derive sustainability more general from this quote, but sustainable development seeks to meet the needs and aspirations of the present without compromising the ability to meet the uh, those of the future. So in other words, we, we don't want to do something now that's going to totally mess up the next generation. Uh, we want to be able to keep this thing going. Uh, as you know, the academics especially have, have kind of broken that down, they often talk about the three E's. Uh, there's the environmental side of sustainability, the economic uh, side of sustainability and an equity side to sustainability. I'm going to focus most of my comments on the environmental side because I think that's where a lot of people uh, tend to tend to gravitate when they say sustain sustainability. But all these things are certainly important. A um, couple comments quickly on the economics and the equity. You know, economics. Uh, I think the good thing there is is for something to be economically sustainable, um, it's got to have a good business case behind it. Um, and that, that's a, what you actually need to, to make a company run. So that there's, there's some great synergy there that I, I think that that case will often work itself out. Certainly not always, but, um, and I, I think that's where some of these new technologies are, are coming into play in the AAM space now to maybe make some of these operations more sustainable economically than they have been before. <clears throat> and equity is another interesting, uh, consideration. Uh, there's certainly lots of. Uh, lots of challenges involved with that. Uh, transportation planning historically has not really been that good in considering equity. And so it is something that's at the, the forefront of people's minds that are developing things in this space, um, which is great. And, uh, you know, hopefully we, we don't mess it up uh, like we, we did oftentimes with, say, like the interstate highway system before on that front and a way to distribute uh, the, the benefits 
equitably uh, among the population. And I, th I think there's some huge opportunities actually in the AAM space to, to really help uh, the equity of our transportation system um, specifically. Uh, but focusing more now on, on the environmental side, um, you know, people realize this is important. Um, so the full life cycle is important and, and companies in the space are recognizing that. So including the production. So how are you sourcing your materials, even where are they coming from, your mining practices, uh, all the way through the, the building of the aircraft, through operating it, uh, and then retiring it at the end of life, um, especially as you talk uh, battery electric systems, there are some, some interesting challenges. Uh, you don't want to just be throwing away a lot of precious metals. So, and some cool ideas people have to, to make it sustainable across the life cycle. Uh, most people are pursuing some sort of electric aircraft or electrified aircraft. Um, not all entirely electric, but many of them are that way. Um, and that certainly offers the potential uh, to, uh, to help the environmental sustainability. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Uh, and as I mentioned before, there's, there's a lot of potential for novel aircraft that can be more efficient, that can be lower noise as you begin to leverage these electrified technologies. Uh, another big thing people are talking about is sharing rides, right? So most of us go jump in our cars and drive by ourselves, but we're very accustomed to jumping in an aircraft with other people. Um, so th there's a big push to, to continue that kind of ride sharing mentality even as we begin to look at these smaller aircraft sizes that, that offers good potential to, to help the environmental sustainability here. Uh, and there's also some interesting land use considerations, right? Um, I don't know who originally said this quote. I, I first heard it from Dan Wolf, the CEO of Cape Air. Um, uh, but, uh, so I'll attribute it to him, but uh, it probably came from somewhere else. If you build a mile of road, you can drive one mile, build a mile of runway and you can go anywhere. Right. So, and even in the case of a lot of these new AAM uh, aircraft, you may not even have to build a whole mile of runway uh, to be able to go a lot further. Uh, so there's some very interesting uh, considerations now as we don't have to cut down uh, forests. We don't have to spend all the, the carbon emissions that at least currently takes to, to actually pave these roads uh, and then to, to maintain them. Um, <clears throat> being a little more flexible in where we can place the nodes of, of the network, the, the airports or vertiports. Uh, offers some interesting potential to help sustainability. Uh, but there are certainly challenges um, on the, the sustainability side in AAM, right? You're, you're fighting gravity, which is, which is difficult and takes energy. Uh, and there's also usually a lower throughput um, of the, the aircraft and the, the infrastructure through which they'll operate uh, compared to say a lane of highway, right? So you're probably not gonna be able to move as many people this way, uh, but you may be able to move them more flexibly and without uh, causing as many negative environmental impacts uh, in the building out of the infrastructure at least. So there, there's an interesting balance point uh, that, that we've got to strike. <clears throat> now, one thing I, I want to point out, and I'll try to do this quickly, that uh, especially if we talk electric aircraft, it, just because it's an electric aircraft doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's you know, green. Um, and that, that really depends uh, primarily upon the energy source um, for that electricity, right? So we, we had uh, without getting into all the details, uh, some, a team from Purdue uh, estimate the demand for different urban air mobility trips around the Chicago and Dallas areas. And when you, you go out and for a couple of different sizes of networks, so small number of, of vertiports uh, up to a large number of vertiports, and you look at you know, the total number of trips changes there, but if you look at the CO2 per passenger mile, it comes out to be pretty similar across them uh, for each city. But when we you know, looked at this data, um, we noticed that, wait a minute, that there's a huge difference in the emissions between Chicago and Dallas. Uh, it turns out that that's due to the electric grid composition there uh, in those places. So uh, Chicago actually has a very large amount of nuclear power, which is incredibly low CO2. Um, some other challenges certainly with nuclear, uh, but uh, a much greener grid, at least in terms of CO2 emissions uh, than Dallas, which gets a lot from natural gas and uh, a decent bit still from coal. Um, so, uh, very large differences in the emissions there, um, <clears throat> just because of that electric grid makeup, right? So as we move towards more electric vehicles, be they on the ground or in the air, we've really got to look at our electrical infrastructure and create more green electrical generation infrastructure to make this make sense. I plotted on the plot on the right where Virginia stands. It's kind of somewhere in between the two, um, in, in terms of greenness, um, so, you know, you could imagine bars that are there somewhere in between those uh, on, on the right side. So not as bad as it could be uh, in the Commonwealth, but uh, certainly room for improvement, I, I think, still, um, especially as we, we need to build more generation capability uh, to meet the, the demands <clears throat> that are coming, uh, both from the air and the ground. 
So now looking more towards the the airports. Uh, so what what can you all at um, uh, HEF be thinking about and, and ways to integrate these new operations into your airports? Um, so big big picture, uh, just comments here on electrification, right? So as as we see more electric aircraft coming into play, you've got to have an electric aircraft friendly airport if you want the aircraft to come there. Um, it's a big point, right? So you, you've got to have some way for them to charge. There's still no charging standard out there, uh, which is an interesting uh, problem, right? I, I think a lot of people want to, to see a common one, uh, but that's some, something that you all can get involved with right now um, if it's something you're interested in. Uh, there, there are some, I think, efforts going on. I can't remember the exact committee in, in SAE uh, that are, are trying to look at some of the standardization there. I think there's great potential, too, um, as you're thinking about these things, to to integrate them where they can be used not just for aircraft but also for ground vehicles. I've heard proposals of, of uh, you know, utilizing the same charging infrastructure for, for say, semi trucks that are electric semi trucks driving across the country. A lot of airports are pretty conveniently located to interstates, and you know, you may just with a small detour be able to get off and get the high, high power levels you'd need to charge those electric trucks, for instance, from the infrastructure at an airport. You can also think about fleets of ground vehicles, um, be they you know, Ubers or some other rental fleets um, charging directly at the airport from a, a shared set of infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> you know, as you look to electrify, um, you're probably gonna need pretty large uh, power loads uh, to be able to handle these aircraft. So estimates vary a lot depending on the size of the aircraft that you're talking about and how many you've got charging, but you can pretty easily get up to the multi megawatt uh, of, of power needed to charge these aircraft at one time. So uh, that that's going to take some some new lines being run um, in most cases um, to the airport that don't exist now, which is going to have a long lead time as you start to work with the utility uh, to be able to bring that in. <clears throat> uh, some other thoughts, um, you know, we've got a lot of land and there seems to be some available land uh, there at Manassas um, that, hey, why don't we use this land, much of which is public? Um, for some sort of renewable generation capability like uh, solar arrays. So there's some installed down at the Chattanooga airport now as one example. We've got some studies ongoing to see what sorts of potential there is at airports. And it's it's pretty substantial when you look across the, the nation as a whole, uh, what you could get out of this infrastructure. So ways to get that, uh, not just to run your electric aircraft operations at the airport, but you could even just sell it back into the grid uh, and maybe have a little bit of money coming into the airport that way. Uh, or just be a good neighbor to your community by, by helping green the grid. <clears throat> uh, some other considerations uh, now trying to, you know, think more on, on the operational side. Um, you know, a lot of these operations are, are multimodal operations, meaning passengers will be coming to the airport via some ground mode and are going to try to transition quickly from a, a car or a train or something onto the aircraft uh, to then fly uh, to their next destination. And so being able to have smooth access uh, for those passengers that, that minimize their delay in that, uh, that mode change is very important. Um, so and that, that's true really of uh, urban air mobility or, or regional air mobility sort of operations. And there's, I think, a lot of opportunity here for um, the fixed space operators for the FBOs uh, at existing airports to, to think about how they can integrate better uh, into the um, uh, existing roadways or rail infrastructure or, or whatever is at the airport uh, to find ways to bring the, the passengers through more quickly. Um, there's also got to be some sort of security screening, most likely, um, you know, likely not, not to the level of 121 uh, sort of TSA screening, but uh, there's some sort of minimal screening that probably will be required public acceptance, if not for TSA requirements, depending on the size of the aircraft. Um, even in Part 135 operations. So trying to find ways to integrate that, uh, that that will minimize the time delay to the passengers is pretty important. Um, <clears throat> and so there's some, some real opportunities, I think, for the FBOs to become uh, kind of gateways to the airport and, and you know, maybe even make some revenue uh, in partnering uh, with some sort of uh, direct or indirect air carrier uh, that's providing these services. Um, as we start thinking more about the electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, or even some of the, the short takeoff and landing aircraft, which I, I think Dr. Langford will talk about here in a little bit, uh, trying to include new infrastructure uh, for those to operate to and from that, that don't necessarily make those aircraft integrate with the traffic pattern at the airport uh, is probably a, a good approach. And then also trying to think about how they get from that, um, that aircraft 
adapt and that, that landing infrastructure to their, their next mode of the trip. Uh, so a picture there of Google uh, image, just the Richmond airport, just some notional places. Hey, you, you could stick some uh, vertiports here, which are more or less have a perpendicular approach path for aircraft coming from the left and from the, the Richmond area. You can see the runway over on the right of the picture. And then it's also nicely tied in with the existing infrastructure designed to get passengers into the terminal quickly. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to wrap it up here with uh, just some closing thoughts. So AAM, um, safe, sustainable, affordable, and accessible aviation for transformational local and intra-regional missions, right? So lots of words, uh, but big picture, we're using aviation in new ways for these shorter range missions, primarily leveraging electrification and automation on board the aircraft. Uh, three primary applications within that, so urban air mobility, uh, regional air mobility, and low altitude mobility, um, or low altitude mobility, you can think more small UAS primarily within that. Um, and this is a um, an emerging area, right? A burgeoning field, I, I say. Lots of things are still to be determined, right? We, we don't have a new type certified AAM aircraft yet, right? So we, we got some thoughts on what may come, but before something certified, it's a little hard to know exactly how how things will evolve. Um, and the regulatory guidance, as those of you who've been following the space, has even changed uh, fairly considerably uh, on the aircraft certification front in the last month and a half or so. Um, so as, as these things evolve, there, there's going to be pivots and changes, uh, but uh, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, and, and you all, every one of you in the room, has, has an opportunity to get involved and shape the future. So I didn't talk about it just per lack of time here, but NASA's got these public working groups that we call the Advanced Air Mobility Ecosystem Working Groups. Uh, you can just Google that, or if you can write down that URL that's on the screen there, um, they're open to the public, um, opportunities to bring people together and, and just discuss some of the, the challenges that are going on and help kind of point, um, point us all together collectively learning in the right direction. Uh, for NASA to bring some of the stuff that we're doing and, and kind of share that for some some early feedback um, in an informal manner. <clears throat> um, and, you know, as especially you think about the Department of Aviation and um, I can't even remember what CIT is now called, BPIC, um, uh, and the sorts of pilot programs and the like that, that are going on within the Commonwealth, uh, more plans for those sorts of things and being able to test these operations and get them going. Um, in, a, in a very limited sense, but being able to learn by doing, I think is hugely important here. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff holding the FAA back on uh, some of their um, uh, their VERPORT guidance um, has just been a lack of information about the aircraft performance, for example, right? So being able to, to actually get out there and, and get some of that data uh, is a hugely important thing and, and you can't overestimate I, or overstate, I should say, the, the value of getting operations going. Um, and for those of you who are involved specifically at, at the airport, you know, there's lots of opportunities for you, I think, right? Um, potentially lots more people could be coming through your doors in the future here in the next few years. Um, and we've got to be able to tie into to multiple modes of, of other transportation, right? So be that cars on the ground, trains, uh, et cetera. Um, and, and I think there's real opportunities here for airports to be multimodal transportation hubs uh, into the future. Um, Lots of opportunities for small UAS operations you know, that you can start doing right now, which I, I let, let Amber talk more about here. Um, and lots of opportunity, I think, as well, just to be a good neighbor in terms of uh, renewable energy generation and, and ways you can uh, be a, a hub for electric vehicles, right? Not just electric aircraft, uh, potentially also the electric ground fleet as well. So I will wrap there um, and look forward to having discussion with you here uh, in a few minutes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Patterson. Uh, Dr. Patterson is going to hang around uh, on Zoom, and uh, we'll have him available to answer some questions at, in the Q&A. But I'd like to uh, introduce now uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Amber Wilson. Uh, Dr. Wilson is the manager of aviation technology for the Virginia Department of Aviation. Uh, in this capacity, uh, Dr. Wilson works closely with agency leaders to guide the Commonwealth's growth and oversight of unmanned aerial systems, advanced air mobility, sustainability aviation fuels, and UAS industry. This is accomplished through developing and recommending rules and regulations to ensure the safe operation 
and integration of UAS, AAM, and other emerging technologies with manned aircraft and educating the public on the benefits of UAS and safe operations. Dr. Wilson completed her PhD in international development from the University of Southern Mississippi. Uh, Dr. Wilson is a McNair scholar, is the recipient of a number of national awards, has numerous publications and has received over a dozen grants, has collected primary data and field domestically and internationally received appointments to several boards and organizations as a member of various professional organizations. She completed her master's of science degree in aerospace, specifically aviation safety and security management, and her bachelor's of science degree in airport management from Middle Tennessee. Dr. Wilson currently governs and manages the Virginia Flight Information Exchange, or Virginia FIX, leads the DOV Advanced Air Mobility Task Force, and co-leads Project George with Tracy Tynan and Virginia Innovation Partnership Corporation. So uh, quite the resume there, Amber. And uh, so without further ado, Thank you for that introduction. Again, Amber Wilson, and I'm gonna chat and shift gears and talk more about the policy aspect. I'm gonna chat about where we were in 2018 prior to that, where we currently are and where we plan to go. So now that you have, um, and this is the overview of it, you'll see the legislative piece in there and I'm gonna pull out two specific pieces of legislation that is our foundational pieces of legislation regarding unmanned systems. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our task force that we've developed internally, as well as Project George, and I'll tell you the formal name soon, and that is uh, an organization, Alliance with VIPC. And then I'm gonna end and, and talk more about what is next. So where were we prior to 2018, where we are currently, and where we are going. So here is a chart of the current pieces of legislation, if you were not aware, that we have regarding unmanned systems. There's two pieces in there that we're gonna chat more in depth today about, and that's Senate Bill 307, as well as House Bill 742. So let me paint this picture of a historical, and we can pass these slides um, and make sure they're posted as well on the website in, in different areas, or contact me. So I see everyone trying to jot those down and take pictures. Um, so let me paint a picture. Historically, prior to 2018, our department, um, there was a couple of different folks working on UAS. One person was leading up the legislative piece. Another person was looking at what is unmanned at, this, at, at that point. What do we need to be doing at the department? The General Assembly in 2018 tasked our department with developing a working group to look at what are we doing across the Commonwealth in unmanned systems, but more importantly, what we're not doing. And I'll chat more about Senate Bill 307 in just a second. So let's paint a picture, right? So prior to 2018, we were doing things, but it was very silo. Uh, there were people uh, in certain areas doing more things. We weren't really sharing, and so people were working on projects, package delivery, NASA was doing what they were doing, but no one was really talking. So the 2018 work group brought this together and brought it to light, and I'll shed more light on that in just a second. So let me share with you, in two th for two consecutive years that Virginia has led the way in unmanned systems. We were number one from Business Facility Magazine for the number one state to do business, and might I add, the reason it's only been two years is because they only examine unmanned systems for two years. They since then look at different areas and rank them through the years. So in 2018, they tasked, the General Assembly tasked us to look at what we're doing and not doing, thus Senate Bill 307. We established this work group, and this work group looked at uh, four different areas, education, federal and state government, local government, and uh, education as well. So four distinct, care, uh, four distinct areas. That group identified a key piece that we were not doing very well. We were not sharing information, right? So we were doing a number of wonderful things with package delivery, with operations, with pilot projects, but we really weren't sharing that um, outside our groups, and we certainly weren't bragging on ourselves and sharing that in the media. So it seemed like some of these other states were, um, may have been doing more, but we just really weren't giving ourselves a pat on the back and kind of sharing that. 
So I'm going to talk more heavily about the Virginia Flight Information Exchange and why that has been a foundational program for us. The DOAV US work group identified that need and we needed a way to share information. We didn't have a way to share information to the, the, the public, to operators, to uh, anyone that was using it, public safety in particular. So we developed what we call the Virginia Flight Information Exchange and it's simply a platform to share information to the public. It looks at uh, advisories. So if you're an operator and you go, and you're state and local government, and I'll chat more about that. But if you're an operator, you can go on www.virginiafix.com, spelled out, and you can see who is up flying, what operations are up. Um, you'll see sensor information, weather information, as well as um, who, who else may be flying up in the, that airspace at that particular time. So here is a chart of what that looks like. Um, our department, if you're familiar with the concept of an SDSP, that's a supplemental data service provider. Um, we are authoritative in nature in the first of its kind. There is not another state agency or organization that governs and manages the data on an SDSP level, and Virginia is doing that. So we are leading the way with that. So this chart shows, and I'll get into more detail on how this all flows together in just a second, but this chart shows um, how everything is put into our system and how we can disseminate that information. So here's that governance model. Remember I talked about Senate Bill 307 coming from the General Assembly at the top. You see that UAS Working Group that is a product of that bill that advised our work, our department on state guidance, advisories, what we need to be doing, what, what are we not doing, how do we collectively collaborate, and then it moves into the, our fixed user group. And I'm going to chat more about this user group. This user group is comprised of state and local government agencies across the Commonwealth, and I'll get into some numbers here in just a second, but the Virginia fixed user group um, helps us update information and gives us lessons learned in real time in the field. Everyone reports that to me and kind of shares that with me as the aviation technology manager, and then you see everything flow into the AS. ASDSP. It's a mouthful. So when this project got started back in 2018 and 19, there were four partners specifically. Our department, the Virginia Department of Transportation, VIPC, who is in the back uh, with us today, as well as our technology partner, ATA. So this list shows our key stakeholders who we've been actively engaged with over the last specifically three and a half years. So let me back up. In 2018, um, there wasn't really much going on across the Commonwealth of information sharing. The DOAV UAS work group got together and decided there needed to be a state authority that appoint person at a state and government level. Our department listened and heard that, and it was becoming very clear that there needed to be a point person. So our department, under our former director, developed the um, aviation technology position. So we're forward leaning. We are one of the first in the entire country to have this. We're the only one to have an aviation technology manager. There is UAS coordinators and managers, but not in this capacity across the country. So in 2019, I was brought on board at a brand new position to lead um, the entire Commonwealth regarding the state policy and infrastructure side of, of aviation technology. So what did this pilot look like? This all rolls into this Virginia Flight Information Exchange. The top of the partners that I just previously spoke about, we onboarded um, very early on. We only had 19 different agencies and 17 users. So keep that number in mind as I share how we escalated that over the year after that. We unveiled this pilot project at Aerospace Legislative Day, uh, January 2020. So just prior to pandemic, we uh, unveiled this, and it's interesting the amount of work we were able to do. For some, I know COVID slowed many aspects down, but for us in this program, being online and being able to readily meet um, often uh, and just easier, quite frankly, there wasn't commute time. It has allowed us to hit the ground running and, and, and really get this project off the ground. So with that said, in January, we unveiled it. And we learned from legislators that day and, and different people that saw the product live that there were a couple of tweaks we needed to keep making. 
We continue to make that prototype and we finished beta testing in May. And I won't go through the exhaustive history of that, but we saw soft launch in the summer of 2020. And I always like to give this plug and it wasn't planned by any means, but July 21st is my birthday. So this being my baby project and something I worked on for years, it was very exciting to see that the first live operation occurred on my birthday that year. And the Virginia Department of Forestry was the first person um, Rodney there was the first person to put in that advisory. So he often uses the Virginia flight information to, uh, to disseminate where he's flying. So if you think of a system uh, much like manned aircraft, you can go look on ATC Live and see who is flying and when they're flying. This is a type of system that allows us to put voluntarily information into the system to see who is up flying um, in an area and also to, to disseminate information at that time. And he uses it specifically when f uh, flying in large populated areas to look at the uh, diseases of trees. He can fly uh, much quicker versus sending a crew of 12 to 18 over several days and weeks to look at specific areas and species of trees. But also the surrounding uh, community often has a lot of questions when you see all these drones up flying. And so that allows him to share with the public, this is what we're doing. It's, we're not just peeking in your window or anything crazy like that. So we continue to work on our technical issues and we onboarded some of the USS Lance providers and I'll tell you that number in a second, we're uh, over 50% of those uh, to date. Our pilot program concluded that year. So one year long pilot program, we moved into phase two for about seven months and then we moved into phase three and beyond. And at that time there was just over 7,000 advisories and I'll tell you that we have over 20,000 now, so it's about a 1,700% increase in one year. So for us, this is pretty example, a uh, pretty fun example for us. So we coordinated with Secret Service. We can chat about it now after the event. Um, but earlier this year, Secret Service was flying and uh, the president was in Culpeper. And so we coordinated that event through our Virginia Flight Information Exchange. And this is a program that is governed and owned and operated by our department, but certainly uh, we have partners that help us sustain it and um, actually demonstrate it. And I'll talk about the Winchester demonstration in just a second. But Stafford, this is another example of what it looks like in the system. We have uh, sensor information, thanks to our partners at VIPC, and they have put sensor information in there that allows us to see perhaps a flooded road. Um, you see 95, it says deconflict. And in this specific example, there was a large crash on 95. At the same time, you have some flooding going on. It was raining that day. Um, there was also a large scale crowd um, demonstration protest that was going on all at the same time. So this is a good picture to show how we can put so much information in and show what is going on in a specific area, which is very helpful to our uh, UI, uh, UIS. Uh, operators. And so by the numbers, what does this mean? So we started with nine agencies, 17 users, and we are now, I think, 51 specifically and 135 users in the Commonwealth. Um, cu currently, there's 20,000 different nav aids and 816 uh, active advisories today. You see the number eight of 16 FA approved Lance providers who are, we are working with. That number is now seven and 15 with the uh, dissolution of Skyward. I have that italicized there. Separately, we have signed agreements with two states. You know, when we launched this program August 5th, 2020, within the first two weeks, we had two, over two dozen. We had 14 different states contact us and say, Virginia, what are you doing? This kind of came out of nowhere. I knew you were working on a pilot project and it had to do with UAS, but what, what are you doing? So we continue to share this and now we have other states that that see us as that leader and that want us to collaborate to share lessons learned and we've happily done that. One example was in the fall of 20, I had the pleasure of speaking in front of the Oklahoma Senate. Uh, they did an interim study on UAS and they wanted to have a Cinderella story and they wanted to take the Virginia model and that was we needed a point person at the state. So just recently, several months ago, they have hired a UAS coordinator at the state commission, airport commission uh, level to also um, lead the charge. Separately, we've, ex we've signed MOA agreements with North Carolina and most, most recently Alaska, and we have six others um, I can't share just yet that are kind of in the works and working out the details of those. 
To the right of your screen, you'll see uh, the agencies or the organizations within our, um, within the Commonwealth that we're working with, and these are the ones that are most active uh, to date. So if you're state or local government, you would request access just simply by going to the website, clicking request login information, that gets shot to me, and then I look, um, make sure that you are who you say you are, that you have credentialed access, and you'll get access to the system. I will say for the public safety folks in the audience, I know it's kind of alarming when some folks hear that there is sensitive information and restricted information in the system. The general public does not see that. Um, you have to have a certain um, access level to be able to see that. Uh, so once you are ex uh, issued your credentials, you, you may or may not be able to see certain things in the system. Um, there we go. And so now I'm going to chat more about um, fix for a national model and really what does that mean. So I've kind of talked about these other states coming and talking to us and trying to figure out, well, it's, it's good that we have this in Virginia, but when I'm flying in the desert and, and working on projects, this is one of our Lance providers, um, how does this help me? It doesn't help me. I can use it in Virginia, but I can't use it out in Arizona or wherever I'm at. And so we are working on a national model thanks to the National League of Cities. We have a ground-to-air planning group that we have launched, and we are learning the different intricacies across the United States to have a harmonized model. If you're familiar with the insurance model, if you've lived in different states, you know that if you have car insurance, you have to uh, have it reissued for the state that you're in. Uh, this is much like that. So you see on our screen that we have been working with uh, FAA and NASA we have some Space Act agreements with our partners as well, uh, DHS and Counter UAS um, as well. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that Project George at the top and in, in, at the top of the slide. So Project George is our pet name. Um, you think of uh, George Jetson. I know many folks will kind of chuckle, and I see an audience. Um, we think back to that time, and it was laughable to think that we have flying cars or flying drones or unmanned systems, um, but that is where we are today. Um, I recently read a report that by 2035, workforce development for AAM specifically will create 280,000 jobs, which is about 8% of the industry, which by then, that, that's, a, that's a large number. So we have joined uh, forces with the Virginia Innovation Partnership Corporation to create the Virginia Advanced Air Mobility Alliance. Um, and I will leave my comments very limited on that just because we have our huge kickoff meeting on the 28th and I wanna be respectful of everyone that's on that team. But with that organization, we are gonna be focused, our specific team is gonna focus on policy. What do we need to be doing at the department to get ready for this, right? We have rules and regulations at airports but what are we gonna create at a state level for vertiports, vertihubs, vertistops? Where is that guidance and that regulation gonna come for future development of AAM? And then Tracy and her team are gonna look at the implementation. She's gonna lead the technology and implementation aspect of that as well as the pilot studies of that. So all this to say, we have really looked at what makes a community drone ready. And I kind of focused on the UAS aspect a little bit of this because we have come from a space where things started in UAS. You saw from Dr. Patterson that it comes from the general aviation UAS communities and all of that makes up eventually AAM. So these are very, these are integral pieces along the way. So I've chatted where we were in 2018 where we didn't have a point person, where we are with a number of incentives and in programs and awards. We have spoke and accepted um, a number of nominations and spoke over 25 presentations and webcasts just on the Virginia Fix in the last year. So we really looked at what makes our, our community drone ready. You need to be drone ready so that you are ready for advanced air mobility and the things that are coming. It's a building block um, system. That's what we like to say and, and think at the state. So here's a great graphic that shows how we leverage the different aspects. I won't go into to detail, but this is a, a chart that we like to use, and it, it shows from public safety to citizens and how everyone works together. It talks about the education piece, which is very important to us. You can have all the best infrastructure, all the great policies, but if you don't have community buy-in and you don't start having those conversations with that local community where you want that vertiport, where you want that vertistop, we have learned very quickly that um, 
it's either much harder or it will not happen. <laughs> and so community conversations from the very beginning through um, inception and then implementation is important. So this is a federated model. I spoke that we are working on a large national model for the United States. Virginia is leading the way in that. Virginia Flood Information Exchange is in the middle. To the right of your screen, it shows the different um, folks that consume the data and how everything funnels into the Virginia Flood Information Exchange. So I know Dr. Patterson showed the chart of the different areas, and uh, that, that I think it was the very first chart, that showed the different areas of advanced air mobility. We like to think of this as one of the pieces to the large puzzle. And we need to get a, a handle on how do we share information and make sure we're doing that well before we continue to build on, uh, build on that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Winchester because it's very important <laughs> to us. It was the first uh, drone fly-in ever. Um, the FAA was there. Uh, they commended us on our, our, uh, our work there. Uh, prior to that, we had a conversation with them and a meeting with them and kind of shared our ideas. And they were blown away. And they said, we get all these great ideas, but a lot of times there aren't questions, there aren't a roadmap, there isn't this, there isn't that, but you have everything together. So on April 30th, um, quickly 60 days, I believe it was, from start to finish, we put together the first live drone uh, fly-in. These are the partners, the different aspects that fed information into the system. And I will say that I know this sounds so abstract, um, but if you contact me, I would be glad to do a demo or shoot you some videos of what this, this system looks like from behind the scenes. You certainly can go to virginiafix.com and see it on the public facing side, but I'd like to share with you on the, the back side of it, because there's uh, a tremendous resources in there. And so this is what it looked like. On April 30th, we had a large scale demonstration that was uh, sponsored and, and developed and put on by VIPC and our other partners at uh, ATA. There were 17 pilots across seven teams that day. We operated uh, just under uh, four hours, 40 operations in a one square mile, and there were no incidents or accidents that occurred that day. This shares a little bit more about that and why that's important, um, but what our goal was and how we work together with the local community. Um, we, are, we have a couple of local community, other communities that want to do a, a fly-in. So that day, let me paint this picture. We had drone up at the top of the hill within a one square mile, had 17 different pilots all up flying. We had recreational flyers. We had drone up doing package delivery. They were actually delivering barbecue to a drop zone and then um, disseminating that. These are the partners that we had to make that, that happen. So you see the different aspects. You've got public safety involved. We had the Shenandoah Apple Blossom Festival, if you're familiar with that. We ran this operation incongruent with their parade on the last day. So you can imagine all these people. Um, I think I heard the figure of like 30,000 people watched the, the, the parade on the last day. So while this is going on, we had this other operation going on at the same time. And so you see the folks that were uh, involved in that. So I share this because we all play a different piece to the pie or, or to the puzzle, depending on how you look at it. We, even, a, even a citizen, their input matters to us because we have recreational flyers and their, their view of it is different from, say, my view. And, and I look at the policy, the safety, the efficiency of it. What do we need to be doing to keep the larger picture safe? So what's next? So I'm going to chat a little bit about the um, Advanced Air Mobility Task Force. So we went from a department that um, needed a position, now we're here, we have this position that looked at UAS, and now UAS has kind of evolved very quickly into realizing we need to be involved in AAM at a larger scale, not just that UAS piece, as there's many layers to that. So last spring, we developed the Advanced Air Mobility Task Force internally, which is made up of myself, led, and then three other uh, individuals from our airport services division and we sat down and looked at what an AAM do we need to be focusing on. It is so broad, but what is our scope? And it became very apparent that our scope is policy, it is airport infrastructure, and how do we get our airports and aviation community ready for what is to come. There are various other aspects from electrification and all the other aspects that, that is not our scope, but for our scope we are going to focus on that. So we developed um, that and shared it with our Virginia Aviation Board, and I'm very excited to say that they were supportive. I didn't think that they wouldn't be. 
But in August, they uh, passed a resolution really wanting us to take the lead um, and advance air mobility on the aviation side and encourage us to work with other agencies. So VIPC, and we wanted one common voice, thus Project George, um, which is the Virginia Advanced Air Mobility Alliance that we have created. The board has also tasked us to enact policies and program manuals to help our airports become ready, and that's what we plan to do as well, and to develop other laws and regulations. I know sometimes there is this um, interesting side of things where we don't want too many regulations or too many policies, but what, from what we're hearing from industry and public-private, as well as our governmental partners, is that Yes, we don't want that. It doesn't need to be overregulated, but there needs to at least be a foundation to which we all operate. We don't need a patchwork of different or, um, laws and regulations. So I'll share with you um, House Bill 742 and chat a little bit about that. I said that um, I broke out 307, how it was our foundational piece and created our UAS work group. Now we're up to what's called House Bill 740, uh, 742. And that's important because last year the General Assembly passed um, a bill saying that local government, so the local area of Manassas, um, can delineate, they delegated, you can tell folks where you would like to take off and land. For example, if the airport said, these are your only two places that you may take off and land, right? They can't govern the airspace once it's up, so someone's flying through. That's Federal Aviation Administration's um, jurisdiction. But where can you take off? At a park. Um, there was some concern across the Commonwealth that there is baseball games and weddings and all these things going on at local parks, but we also have these drones flying wherever they want to fly. Um, and that's great. We support our recreational flyers and our kids and our students in education and learning and to become pilots. We certainly, but we also want to be safe. And so this will allow them to say, hey, you may fly in our park, and we welcome that, but please take off and land at these two locations or three, wh whichever they decide. And so in August, our former governor signed that emergency regulation, and it is going through the full standard regulation process now. And we expect that within the next several, month, several months to be uh, put forth as a full regulation. So if a locality puts that forth, we can go ahead and adopt that, and it becomes the rule and regulation for that area. So why that's important is because we have House Bill 742, but how do you disseminate that information? Most folks may or may not even know that that's a new law. And so how do we disseminate that information? So once we receive it, we are gonna be posting that on our website and we go through a, a vetting process to approve that. And then we're also gonna disseminate that to the Virginia Flight Information Exchange. So if I'm an operator and I log in and I say, this is where I'm flying, this is my operation, and say I'm on a road that's adjacent to a park, but that road is owned by the park, I can see I cannot take off on this road or this grass area these are the only two takeoff and landings uh, areas that I'm allowed to take off and land. So it'll give them the information, and obviously it's up to them to abide by that, but also it's, it is breaking the law and can get law enforcement involved. So that's important to us. We're going through that regulation process now. And so going back to the task force, we looked at, we needed a team to advise us, right? We are policy, but what policies comprise up of so many different aspects from the energy side of things, so we needed a team that could advise us. We have about a 20-person team, um, the aviation, DOAV AAM advisory team, and that is the one of the teams of Project George. So if you have Project George up here that is our large one voice for Virginia and what we're doing for advanced air mobility, there are two sections of that, our team and the VIPC. So again, we're gonna be focusing on a policy change, uh, regulation, what do we need to be doing over the next year as a department? What is our one, and I, I don't like to give too many, too many lofty goals, but what is our one, two, or three goals that we want to accomplish this year? What are the additional resources? It's becoming very clear that their uh, AAM is large, but there still needs to be someone in UAS. What are the resources? Is it manpower? Is it more committees? You know, what, what does that look like? We, we don't know yet when we're examining that. And also, what legislation do we need to put forth? Right, so advanced air mobility is coming at a federal level, and they're uh, at some point delegating a number of aspects to the state. We don't want to be playing catch up. We want to continue to lead the way in unmanned systems as well as advanced air mobility. So we need to be positioning ourselves very well um, for that and what's to come. And so with that, 
I'll turn it back over. I know that was a lot of information. Thanks, Juan. Thank you, Amber. Uh, you know, every time I attend these things, I learn something new. I didn't know that we have the ability to uh, restrict where someone would take off and land. I don't know if it's necessary, obviously, in Manassas to, to do something like that, but it's nice to know that uh, that's something that uh, is possible maybe in the future. Um, our next speaker, um, I, I failed to mention when, when I started off here that, you know, uh, Manassas is fortunate enough to have, you know, several companies that are on the cutting edge of, of technologies when it comes to uh, AM and uh, that happens to be Aurora Flight Sciences and Electric Aero. Well, our next speaker happens to be uh, the person who started both of those companies. So uh, it's with great pleasure, and I think many people here that have been in Manassas for a while uh, know of uh, Dr. Langford, John Langford. But uh, uh, I'll just quickly go over uh, his uh, bio. John Langford, uh, Dr. Langford, currently serves as chairman and chief executive of Electro Aero. Uh, he is an aerospace entrepreneur who founded Aurora Flight Sciences in 1989, uh, Athena Technologies in 1998, and Electro Aero in 2020. Aurora pioneered advanced robotic aircraft, Athena developed advanced flight control solutions, and uh, Electric is, Electra is developing sustainable aviation solutions for regional mobility. Uh, Athena was sold to Rockwell Collins in 2008, and Aurora was sold to Boeing in 2017. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the immediate past president of the American Institute of Aeronautics. And so with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Langford. Uh, Well, thank you, Juan. It's a real, real pleasure to be here this evening, and thank you all for turning out for this, uh, for the seminar. Um, so, so uh, Greg and, and Michael and, and Amber have covered a lot of ground here uh, this evening, and uh, I'm sure we've all learned a lot. I've, I've certainly learned a lot in, in these previous talks. What I wanted to try to do in this last uh, few minutes, and, and I'll be brief, is just kind of present a perspective from the private uh, industry point of view, sort of the co company point of view. And let me see first if I can get these charts up. Okay. What are we doing? Okay there, but I may have to ask for the... IT people to come up and launch this into uh, the presentation mode. Could you do that for me? There, got it. Okay, thank you. Just, just the thought is enough. So, um, as as uh, as you've kind of heard there, there is a lot of activity in this space, and I think one of the questions a lot of us who've been around for a while ask is. Is this a rerun of the VLJ uh, experience from the early part of this, uh, of this century? Is it more like the sort of commercial drone boom we saw a decade ago? You know, where does this all play out? There's a lot of, of ideas. The, these are like the top 20 in this slide of the, of the AAM reality index that a consulting firm uh, publishes. And, you know, the good side is this is a really exciting time to be in this space, as, as I think you've probably gathered from the previous speakers. And the other side, you know, this is one of those areas where not everybody's going to survive in this. There's, a, there's way more ideas than are going to end up being successful uh, and adopted, and that's what gives it the vitality, but it's also what makes it, um, uh, you know, somewhat speculative, and I think the city is doing exactly the right thing of considering its options really, really carefully. I wanted to speak just for a minute on some of the challenges of making electric airplanes, right? Um, the, all of this enthusiasm sort of starts with the presumption that electric airplanes are a good idea. Well, 
why do we think that, uh, and is it true? Electric cars seem like a great idea. Um, you know, there are a lot more of, of them today than there were uh, a couple of years ago, and, and, and there's going to be a lot more. A lot of people today probably wish they had uh, electric cars um, with the gasoline prices. Um, but there are some important differences driven by physics that make it probably less, uh, less attractive on the airplane side. At, at first glance, it looks pretty good. These are sort of the four ways that airplanes that you can think of to power airplanes, turboprops, turbofans, batteries, fuel cells, and you kind of start with some energy source on board, some amount of energy that you put on the airplane, and then you have to do some process to turn it into useful work, the propulsion that drives the airplane. And when you look at turboprops and turbofans, you know, uh, they're pretty, they're amazingly bad in terms of the overall efficiency, like about, you know, a third of the energy you start out with actually gets used in useful work. Most of the rest goes out the tailpipe and heat and exhaust. Batteries look really good. They're very high efficiency. Fuel cells kind of in the, in the middle there. Um, the problem that airplanes have that cars don't is that it really matters how much it weighs. And so a lot of, a lot of work gets put into something called specific energy, which is essentially how much energy, watt hours is generally the measure, per weight, uh, or in this case, kilograms. And then also how much space does it take up in addition. So on the lower left of this chart is stuff like flywheels and rubber bands and batteries and compressed air, uh, old, bat old style batteries. And on the right hand side of this is hydrogen, which has got a lot of energy, but how much space it takes depends on whether you use it as a gas and at what pressure, if you pump it up to really high pressures or you liquefy it. Um, and you can see how good, it turns out it's really hard to beat gasoline or kerosene, JP8, you know, the kinds of conventional hydrocarbon fuels. Also on this chart, you know, you can see things like cream and milk and stuff like that, just sort of where they, they go in there, which, you know, they're pretty good fuels, um, as evidenced by the, if you look at the, you know, the calories that, that, that humans burn uh, every day. And, and, and other animals. And then batteries are kind of down in the, on the, uh, you know, the lower left-hand side. So you're, you're definitely starting um, from a, a space that is, is not anything like what we're used to with conventional aviation fuels. This was a project I was fortunate enough to work on as a, as a student, as a grad student. Um, and it was a human-powered airplane, but it was a hybrid electric human-powered airplane. The human and it had batteries, and the human got to charge up the batteries, and then the two of them together, the batteries and the, and the pilot, um, flew the plane, and this was for a competition that uh, the Royal Aeronautical Society had. And I point this out because the human, I put that in a blue circle, that's their energy density and specific um, volume, and you know, they're, the human is a little worse than the batteries, or the batteries are a little better than the human, but not very much. <laughs> and so people would not really propose human-powered airplanes as a, as a practical transportation mode, uh, and yet they enthusiastically embrace electric airplanes. This is, a, this is a chart that is a little more technical detail. It spans the whole history of aviation from the Wright brothers to today. The top line is that specific energy of, of, uh, of, of fuel, aviation fuel, once you burn it through some kind of an engine, so you can see pistons and then and turbofans, and they get better at roughly 1% a year over the history of, of airplanes. And then down at the bottom is batteries, which have been getting better um, much faster, 2% uh, a year growth rate on that. And then some of the recent battery growth things, maybe for percent a year, but you still have a really long way to go. This is a log scale um, to, to get to anything approaching conventional fuels. I put on there that little blue thing. That is the largest currently certified aviation battery that you can buy, right, in terms of uh, that has a TSO that you can actually buy and put in an airplane. It's about 80 watt hours per kilogram, okay? Um, and, and part of the problem is not only are batteries not very good, but then when you put them into airplanes, you have both the packaging requirements to make them safe in an airplane, a human-rated airplane, 
think 787 battery uh, uh, story. And then you have operational details where you never use all the energy that's in an airplane on a flight. It's amazing how much energy, not airplanes take off with, but how much energy they land with on board. And you know, the really long flights tend to burn most of their energy, but a lot of the, the short flights you'll land with like half the energy you took off with. So reserves are a really big issue that battery airplane advocates don't like to talk about because it's really hard. The bottom line of this is you take the battery cells and by the time you get all done, you can have somewhere between a quarter and a half of what you thought you started with available to actually do missions. And as you can imagine, that does bad things to your performance on an airplane. This is a, a payload range of sort of a notional commuter airplane. This happens to be um, a, a Dash 6, a Twin Otter, and you can see payload and range. Um, this is a canonical payload range form. And then this is what happens if you make it a hybrid airplane, um, more and more electric. The black line is what you started with. The green line, I know it's a little hard to see, but the green solid line is what you would do if it was a pure battery airplane. And then the, as, as you go hybrid, you go in between. So this is an example of how much worse if you take an existing airplane and make it electric it always gets worse, and not by a little. It gets a lot worse. Um, there's one particular example of an airplane that is actually made in both conventional fuel and battery-powered versions. It's made by Pipistrel over in, in Slovenia. It's, the, it has a, it's, it's certified in Europe as a light sport category. There are, there are today no certified electric airplanes in operation in the United States. Everybody's, op and if you see one flying, they're operating under some type of experimental um, cert. Um, and this, this direct comparison of the Alpha and the Alpha Electra, uh, they've changed some names on, 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 uh, on the production version, but it's about a factor of six, the, the electric version is about one-sixth the amount of useful work on it that you can do um, with the gasoline version. So um, why would anybody do this, right? I mean, <laughs> um, why would you take a perfectly good airplane and make it one-tenth the performance that it used to have? Well, there's sort of three big reasons you might be interested in this. One is market unlocks. Um, one of the advantages of these electric is there, there's some good things you can do with noise. Um, you may be restricted in where you can operate. Amber was talking about restrictions of flying and stuff. Well, people may say you can't have carbon emissions out of an airplane uh, if you want to fly in our, in our locale. Not many places have done that yet. Could, could be in the future. The second is niche markets. Like some things don't care about lousy performance. Trainers, for example, if you're just going around the pattern, okay, you don't really need an airplane that can go 800 miles. Um, some of the things like these high altitude solar airplanes, um, they, you know, uh, they certainly are going to use batteries. And this urban air mobility that w Michael was talking about, where short range, you know, maybe battery is good enough to do a cross uh, town, uh, cross town mission. And then the third area, which I'm a big believer in, is what we call performance through integration, where the idea of going to electric propulsion allows you as a designer the freedom to do different things that you couldn't do with um, traditional propulsion things. And that is primarily to integrate propulsion and aerodynamics together in a way that does something really different. And you get a performance benefit from that something different that is more than the penalty you're paying for going electric. And that really is where uh, we are today at Electra.Aero, our, our central uh, focus in this in this startup that that uh, that we're doing here. I think you can actually see the sign the, at, right out the window. There's um, is uh, is is where it's it's happening here in Manassas. And the focus is on decarbonizing aviation, starting with small aircraft first, but eventually we've got to be able to do this on on very large scales. This is what we're working on. It's a hybrid electric blown lift airplane that is designed to work in both the UAM and the regional market, exactly what Michael was talking about. 
Um, the first product is sort of a nine passenger, sort of 500 mile um, vehicle, but it's designed to fly out of a soccer field. So a takeoff and landing uh, of about 100 uh, to 150 foot ground roll with a sort of balanced field length isn't exactly right, but 300 foot field size. So uh, think soccer field and with very, very low acoustics. It's hybrid electric, so it has batteries, but it also has a turbo generator. Think of a Prius that uses an APU or a small you know, jet engine, gas turbine, uh, instead of the internal combustion engine. And those two work together to drive a bunch of electric motors along the leading edge. And those electric motors, that distributed electric, is what gives you this technique called blown lift. The blown lift is some, not new. I mean, NASA was working on this uh, in the 60s and, and in, the, in the 70s. The blown lift allows you to do something like three times the lift coefficient which allows you to do much slower takeoff and landing speeds, think around 30 knots, um, and that allows you to do these really short takeoff and landing things. And you can combine that with low, low noise, so good acoustics, um, actually really good fuel um, efficiency, low, the low emissions and so on. And so we think this is really quite a winning combination. What that pays off for you and what our sort of level zero design requirement is to be able to fly in and out of the Wall Street heliport in Manhattan. There are three heliports around the edge of, of, of Manhattan, and uh, all of them today are just used for, hel um, for helicopters, but this airplane is designed to be able to use those same spaces, essentially the operational flexibility of a helicopter with the operating cost being below those of a fixed wing. And the physics in that illustration are, are correct that I just showed you. So our focus is on, as we said, urban and regional mobility. The, there's, as you can imagine, there's a lot of government interest in this in terms of being able to get people really quietly in and out of places that aren't airports. Um, the whole VIP and charter side, and very significantly the cargo and logistics, where, again, Michael talked about some of this, but a lot of the retail distribution network is not served by air today. You know, you have airplanes for the long, you know, the Trans-Pacific is air and, and container ships. The last mile, people are talking about drone deliveries, maybe someday. Um, it is happening, by the way. I mean, it's, it's just taking a lot longer than Jeff Bezos promised in, in 2013. Um, but it is coming. Um, and most of that middle, uh, middle mile doesn't have any air uh, service, and these kind of vehicles are gonna be able to do that. This is an example of the noise footprint. On the right-hand side is a Cessna caravan operating out of Santa Monica. Those are footprints of the, the green is the 65 dBA and yellow is 75 uh, dBA contours. The, uh, the Electra airplane is shown on the left, so um, it not only spends less time on the ground, but it climbs quickly, and so it exposes a lot less. As, as you could tell from Michael's part, NASA's a big, uh, an important player in this. Um, we're, we're delighted to be, to be working with them, and Michael has been invaluable in getting the idea that, that it's not, we shouldn't pre-select the technology, right? It's not just eVTOL, it's what can do the mission for urban and regional air mobility, and so don't be dogmatic about uh, uh, it has to be vertical or it has to be battery only, but what's the right solution to the design requirements? And then just some, a couple of really closing thoughts is, number one, decarbonization is absolutely essential for aviation, but the exact path that it's gonna take is not yet clear, right? You hear a lot about SAF, sustainable aviation fuels. Those are essentially um, offset schemes, right, um, where you take carbon out of the air while you make the fuel and you put it back in when you burn it and the big OEMs love that because it means they don't have to change their airplanes and all the, the decarbonization change takes upstream on the fuel companies, right? Okay, maybe that's gonna, in the short term, that's what everybody's talking about, we'll see. At the other end you got hydrogen where people are going, we have to go pure hydrogen, that's a big infrastructure Electric will definitely be in there, but is it going to be a bunch of electric charging stations out front? I don't know. I, I mean, if you just look out that window and go, how many of those guys are going to be electric airplanes five years from now? 
Um, I'll make a bet that it's a very small number that you don't need too many hands to count on, uh, on that. Electric propulsion is definitely m more challenging for airplanes than cars. Um, so I, just a, a closing comment that Manassas, uh, I think, has been, as, we, as has been said before, is a real leader in this. I really salute you, Juan, and the, and the uh, airport board and the city council for taking the lead in grappling with some of these issues, thinking about it. Um, it's obvious that we're, you're going to continue. Um, this is what it means to be a leader, sort of work on the, the hard problems before uh, the solutions are really obvious. And just in closing, as, as, as Juan said, I, you know, Manassas has also been a great business environment. Um, and, and, you know, with help throughout from the state and from CIT and the development of, of Aurora, you know, when we came, when, when we were Aurora moving here back in 1991, it was, you know, smaller than the folks working on Electra today moving out from, uh, from Alexandria. And the city manager, I mean, the airport manager, Ali Kramer, took a real chance on us, right? Most people would have said, no, <laughs> we, we're not going to put up with that. Um, but we have been really fortunate um, to have great leadership from folks like Juan, his predecessors, um, who understand that you have to lean in on this and that, you know, these l small companies, new technologies, uh, they, can, they lead to great things often, uh, and they can, but they also, you know, are, are, are have some unusual uh, requests along the way in terms of, we want to do a truck test on your runway, or we want to fly this eVTOL out on your runway, or we want to do this, that, or the other. And it is a real uh, give and take partnership, and I, I can tell you we really deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. Uh, a lot of information uh, has been uh, disseminated this uh, evening. And uh, I was prepared to start the panel off with some questions, but I think uh, I would prefer at this point to just open it up for questions for the audience, because I think it's more important for those folks who, who came out here tonight. If you have questions, uh, it's a great panel to field them. Uh, I believe Dr. Patterson is still with us. Uh, so if you have any questions specifically for him. Uh, so I have two mics. Uh, Matt has one over here, and Jolene has another one. So uh, let's start off. Uh, who has a question for the panel? If you don't have any questions, then I'm going to start asking mine, and you don't want to hear mine. Okay, so yes, sir. The mic's come. Can you bring the mic up, Matt? This is a uh, question for our uh, NASA contingent. You guys do awesome work and lots of research. In my field, we find a lot of questions in this new uh, world, technical questions that is perfect for NASA to investigate. How do we get your attention to see if you're interested in investigating certain technical problems? NASA classics research. Yeah, so can y'all y'all hear me? Somebody give a thumbs up? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I, there's, there's a few ways. I mean, um, Certainly the AM ecosystem working groups that I mentioned earlier are, are one place to, uh, to come forward and to bring suggestions of things uh, so that those are a, a newer mechanism for us, uh, certainly an informal one. Um, I, I think you know, most of the, the formal advisory stuff, actually John Lankford, I want to thank John for his, his help as a part of his National Academy's work, uh, has been a, a part of what was called the Aeronautics Research and Technology Roundtable, a little bit of a mouthful. Um, but that, that's been an avenue that those are public meetings as well. Um, uh, but generally that, that input has come from the, the panelists there uh, that bring up issues uh, that, that folks want to see, see handled. Uh, there are occasionally some, some general requests for information that are put out uh, in the space. Uh, I don't know. There's, there's probably, I think we still have one kind of general one that's out there and I'd have to dig it up. Uh, in the advanced air mobility space that was just really broad uh, that we created basically as a part of the AM ecosystem working groups for folks just to, to send us thoughts um, and, and to raise those those questions. Uh, but certainly I would say, you know, 
grabbing somebody uh, if, if you come across them at a conference or something like that and having that, that personal conversation is always another good way. I know that's not a, a formal way to do it, um, but just a, a way to put a bug in somebody's ear. Um, building connections in, in that sense is another one. So I'm probably missing uh, one or two other avenues, but those are, those are the things that are coming to my mind at the moment. Okay, thank you. Well, any other questions? Please raise your hand. All right. Hello. I had a question from the policy side. Um, to my understanding, there has been recent um, guidance from a committee to the FAA to look into furthering the beyond line of sight operations of drones. What Do you have any insights onto the feasibility of them expanding that and or is Virginia involved in those types of discussions in any way? Thank you so much for being here. So yes, uh, we are actively involved. Tracy and her team, um, she's, uh, it falls under her purview specifically. Most recently, uh, press release hasn't been issued, but it is public knowledge on the FAA website, so I will share it here tonight. Um, the MAP program, the Mid-Atlantic Aviation Partnership, did receive the, um, the field testing. They were one of two that were awarded, the other was New York. So we are actively involved in the BV loss and the field testing regarding that. But Tracy, not to throw you under the bus, she would be the person to chat with a little bit more about that, um, as well as Tombo Jones out at the Mid-Atlantic Mid Aviation Partnership. I hope that answers your question. Well, I'll ask the question for the group while everybody out there formulates their next question. So uh, this is for our, the entire panel. Uh, how has AM changed in the past five years and what can we expect to see in the way of progress in the world of AM in the next five years? Sure, um, well, it is, it is the, the two big drivers, there's probably three big, a, a couple of big drivers. Obviously, NASA has been, has been one. I mean, Michael and his team um, are real leaders in this. But I, I, I got to believe Uber, um, you know, was a, was a big thing. Uber Elevate, when Uber came out and said, hey, we're going to make flying um, uh, uh, Ubers, <laughs> um, that was transformational in terms of the public perception that, oh, this might be real. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, the, the, the other big change was starting about two years ago, this SPAC phenomenon, these special purpose investment uh, uh, committees that allowed s essentially startups to become public companies and to raise large amounts of capital very quickly. That's how Joe B. Archer, Vertical, um, Lilium, uh, have basically done that, which is a big difference. There, the SPACs really didn't play a part in that in the VLJ uh, period or the or the commercial drone period. But I would say um, NASA, as always, is sort of seeding this. But the two big things to me are the Uber Elevate movement and the SPACs. And naturally, I'm going to speak from a policy state government perspective, probably the more boring side of it. But historically, we went from no drone regulations to the current eight on the books. And so in the last five years, we have seen those come to light. And in the next five years, we tend to focus on what is next. And one of the things that we're looking at is if we think of a traditional airport infrastructure, how do we generate fees at airports? Well, now we're faced with those funds are put forth towards airport, right? You have airport user fees and you want them spent at airports for pavement and hangars and all the things. But then you have this whole other concept of UAS, AAM, how do we fund our unmanned space? How do we generate fees for the unmanned space? So we're looking at, do we create some type of fee structure or a registration for drones commercially so that way we can support these expansions into this field? So we are looking at what does that look like? Does that mean that we um, have a regulation to 
have you register all your drones? We don't know yet, but we're looking at that. The other thing is where do we put these, right? So we can use our existing infrastructure at airports and existing helipads, but what if we wanted to um, develop one, say, in Tyson's Corner or name whichever else area? There needs to be ordinances and rules and regulations, much like where we can put airports. Where can we put these vertiports that make it safe as well? You just heard from the experts, but I'll just follow on to say that from a state aviation perspective, um, in the last five years, uh, the picture has become more clear. Um, the technology has evolved to the, to the point where um, we now can see uh, a path forward, we can see the reality, and our, our mission has become clear that we need to um, not only integrate this new technology, but also um, do our part to educate the public, um, and that's why events like this are so important, but, um, and, and look for opportunities for this technology to benefit communities of all size not just the, the urban centers, but also the more rural areas of the, states and, uh, the state and how this technology can really benefit the Commonwealth um, in so many ways. And I know we're not the only state looking at it that way, but I, in my mind in the last couple of years, it's, it's really um, taken a huge step forward in, in being something that now we can see as being uh, reality in, in the future. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll echo uh, John's thoughts, uh, and you know I think it was right at just over five years ago Uber held their first kind of conference in the space, which was still a pretty small group of people at that time uh, that that were talking about this stuff. And since then, it, it's really gone much more mainstream, and I, I think we've seen it grow more than just the the aircraft manufacturers too. So I wasn't really in the industry at the time for the VLJ phase, but I, I think there's been um, a much more whole ecosystem approach probably this time, uh, for maybe lack of a better word, um, and, and a lot more people coming around to recognize the, the policy issues that need to change, as well as the infrastructure and all the pieces of the, the pie that need to come together. Uh, and I, I think there's there's a, a much greater community that, that's much broader and across all the different areas now than that there was five years ago. Uh, which is great to see that. And I, I think there's also kind of a little bit of a shifting probably in, in some of the, the dominant viewpoints on how these operations are going to look. And, um, you know, we're, we're seeing more companies, I, I think, move towards, a, I'll say, a more evolutionary approach uh, to, to get to the future as opposed to kind of the more revolutionary approach um, that was being posited um, very strongly uh, about five years ago. So, uh, you know, time will tell where it comes out. Um, also say the FAA has... Um, really come on board and, and jumped in uh, head first at this point uh, and trying to trying to work to make it possible from a regulatory standpoint um, as well and a great great to see the progress that they've made here too okay uh, I see a hand that came up here gentleman in the center there this is for dr. Patterson but perhaps everybody on the panel um, the OV1 that you showed I thought was very good with uh, UAM uh, low altitude mobility, and regional air mobility. For those first two, how are you going to fit those into the national aerospace system? Yeah, great question. Um, so there's uh, low altitude uh, stuff is really building on the UTM paradigm, so UAS traffic management. Um, and the FAA has got a, a CONOPS out there if, if you Google UAS uh, traffic management CONOPS FAA it, it should pop up um, and the you know SDSP that that is the Virginia fix is um, you know kind of fits into that architecture as well so that'll, that'll help you if you, you dig into that to understand kind of how that fits uh, so general gist of those operations right now though is typically keeping them you know away from the airport um, existing airport environments and limiting the altitudes at which they can go um, and there's only so long that that's going to work um, you know, I think you're, you're going to see people wanting to push to higher altitudes and other things. And um, the urban air mobility side of the house is really kind of trying to expand upon that, that same framework um, in terms of information sharing that, that was really pioneered in the UTM area uh, and expanding that to higher altitudes in uh, limited pockets of airspace, I'll say. Uh, currently, the the thought, and if you, you can also Google this one, there's an FAA CONOPS out there for urban air mobility. Um, it's a, a, 
research conops, I think is the, the term that the FAA likes to use there. So it's not that they're going to go out and build it as it as it exists in that conops exactly today, but kind of setting their their research path on the way forward. And the general thought there is, you know, within controlled airspace uh, today, in particular, uh, carving out lanes, if you will, in the sky where these UAM aircraft may be able to operate in this cooperative uh, fashion where they're sharing information with one another and utilizing what are called providers of services for UAM or PSUs, which is a bit of a mouthful, I know, um, and to be able to share that information and to uh, safely operate in closer proximity uh, than typical aircraft do today, all without having to burden ATC. Because you think about a lot of these uh, existing urban areas, they're, they're in Class B or Bravo airspace, right, where you've got lots of air traffic already air traffic controllers are already pretty slammed uh trying to keep the existing traffic safe so uh that there are uh, thoughts laid out in that con ops for for how that that may be alleviated but certainly some challenges that we're still actively working through along with the faa and some of our research projects on that front um probably talk for an hour on just that topic so i'll, I'll leave it there for now but hopefully those are some good references to point you towards Thank you. Thank the, uh, the panel. You are fantastic. We, I learned so much this evening, so thank you. But, you know, we've really come a long way from toys to AAM, and it's, uh, the future is coming up very quickly. The commercialization of the space is emerging very quickly. Uh, unf and I've heard the word safety mentioned a few times by NASA and this, the state. And my question, I went on to the website today, the FAA and the NTSB, and I've noticed that Though there are many unique uh, attributes within this space in terms of the data that's needed to really identify risks, when I went into the FAA and NTSB sites today, they have nothing uh, to really identify uh, the unique uh, classification of accidents that, and incidents that may occur in this space. And I was wondering if NASA or anybody is actually doing the work to actually I identify, you know, where the risks will be emerging in this space as we move into uh, UTM and uh, commercial drone operations. So maybe I'll, I'll start and let another panelist chime in. Uh, we've got a whole research project uh, called the System-Wide Safety Project that's really focusing on, on those sorts of questions. Uh, so they've I've uh, been doing some test flights actually even just recently with with drones uh, focusing on that lower altitude uh, UTM environment and, and determining some of the risks there. Uh, there have been some cool tools that they've developed, uh, including a, a ground risk assessment uh, capability that, that uses a database population data. And I think maybe they're even now trying to augment that with with cameras on board the aircraft to, to look at the real time risk uh, and, and how that's changing in, in real time. Uh, but bigger picture, all that uh, system-wide safety work fits into what, what they call an, uh, get the acronym right, it's the IASMS, In Time Aviation Safety Management System. Uh, so the idea there is to be able to, to bring in data from a myriad of sources, uh, be able to process that data and use it uh, to help recognize when something's going wrong in the system, uh, kind of in a prognostic uh, way, and be able to take action before something happens that's bad, right? Uh, but then also have a wealth of data on our hands for when something goes wrong, because inevitably something will. Uh, we, we can't make a perfect system no matter how hard we try. Um, that once that, that incident happens or accident happens, we can then have more data sources that we can go back and analyze and, and be able to better predict what caused that or better understand what caused that so that we can better predict those sorts of things in the future and help avoid them from happening. Um, a few resources there. Uh, Kyle Ellis, I think, has been the lead author on an IASMS CONOPS, uh, so something else to Google there. So, uh, in time, aviation safety management system concept of operations to parse all those words for you. Um, worth worth looking into there, and, and uh, certainly those within the SWS project are much smarter than me and, and can talk much more in depth about those sorts of uh, the details under the hood of what they're working, but. Yeah, it's, it's definitely an issue, right? And as we start talking about tons more operations, potentially uh, the, the magnitude of accidents and incidents, incidents that we see uh, barring some you know, step change in, in safety levels is, is probably gonna go up. So how do we, how do we minimize that, that impact is, is a big question and uh, one the FAA is grappling with and, and one that we're, we're trying to help as much as we can on our research fronts. 
Anybody on the panel want to add? Okay. So I'll add two things. So since I've been with the department, um, there have been two incidents that have been reported to us, and that's in a three and a half year span. I'm sure there's many more that can be defined as an incident, um, but there has been two. And then separately, most recently, the FAA has come down and said, you know, the airports need to look at safety plans. Um, right now, I think Dr. Patterson and Langford both spoke on the topic of, we're just trying to keep them away from our airports right now to keep it safe and out of the airspace. But what are you doing when that happens? I know at Richmond, all air traffic stops to try to get out of the area. And if you can imagine, it's a nightmare. So what is the safety plan that they have in place specifically for UASs uh, in, in the airspace? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm speaking now more from the AAM side. I mean, Electra's airplane is 10,000 pound gross weight, so it's a real airplane. Um, and it sort of addresses that question of FAA um, uh, operations. We don't see any issues operating within the current national airspace system. Where we see the issues is what Amber was talking about a minute ago, which is local regulations. Um, the, you know, it's the old joke about you can fly a helicopter, where can you fly a helicopter? You can fly a helicopter anywhere once, but they're so loud that once you land someplace, the FAA will let you fly just about anywhere, um, but then a local municipality will quickly pass regulations that say you can't do that, right? And so the acoustics are a big part of the environmental compatibility. The local regulations we think are going to be much more challenging than the, uh, than the national. It's, it's that um, that, you know, having to figure out what is every different uh, municipality, what are the rules. On the safety side, I, I would say that one of the really fascinating things to me is there are two very, very different cultures at play here. On the one hand is what I'm going to call the Silicon Valley culture, which is, uh, you know, the venture money, uh, tech company startups uh, who are like, oh, you guys in aerospace, you are so slow, you are so expensive, we're going to show you how to do it. And, uh, and that FAA, those, those FAA guys, I'm sure we can take care of them. And what they've learned is you don't roll the FAA, right? That you have to be working hand in glove with the FAA from the very start of this as a true partner, um, as all the aviation companies that have been successful have learned, right? This is a communal effort. A lot of safety is from uh, open reporting. That's another one of the Silicon Valley traits is secrecy, right? They want to do everything in secret, and uh, including their mishaps, um, and not ever talk about it. Whereas in aviation, obviously, we spend exhaustive amounts of time studying everything that goes wrong. I will say that two, two other things that NASA does that is great. One is the national campaign, where they're bringing in a lot of these uh, new entrants and saying, come fly with us. The good part is we'll give you a lot of test expertise. The other side is we'll actually get to see what you can really do. Um, and the other part is there's aviation safety reporting system, right, which is um, an anonymous uh, uh, system that pilots can use. You know, one of the big issues in the current safety system is near misses, right? It's, when, when you have an accident, it's pretty obvious. The real challenge to me is the near misses. How do you, how you can learn so much from the accident that almost happened but didn't, but a lot of flight crews don't want to report near misses because they don't want to endanger their, um, uh, their rating, right, which is their livelihood. And so the NASA system, which runs in parallel to the FAA, uh, actually collects a lot more useful information because it's reporting on stuff that were not actually rateable accidents, but were things that almost were. So developing all of that, you know, moving from that Wild West Silicon Valley culture into the aviation safety, but at the same time, you know, continuing to push forward um, the, the, the safety culture we have. Aviation has such a high safety bar, right, that it is, um, it is really daunting. It's something we can all be proud of, but it's also something that is a, a real challenge. It's, it's why these UAS test sites that, that, that Amber was talking about are so important, because you can't just go into the national airspace system and mess around, right, or try something new to see if it works, because it's a very uh, advanced, finely tuned, but very brittle system, right, that depends on a lot of people doing a lot of manual operations. and so. These test sites are super important for, for, uh, for learning 
And then the NASA reporting systems are important for learning the lessons of what doesn't work before it turns into a big accident. All right, we're running short of time, but I'm going to ask one more question. I'll take the uh, prerogative. And that is, what is the biggest challenge facing AM at this moment? Uh, hype. The biggest problem that we face is being overhyped into impossible expectations that can never be met. Well, aside from the obvious funding, because there is a number of projects that we always could do and resources across AAM funding, um, I would say the education aspect of it. So often we get so entrenched in our acronyms and we can speak in entire sentences on acronyms, but are we really educating and talking to the community and making sure the community is engaged with that? It doesn't always happen, and then later on it backfires. So I would say the, the community aspect. I agree, and information and communication, Sherry. And I'd say just let's, we gotta get over the hurdle of uh, certifying these novel technologies. Right, so there's several things in the pipeline seems to be coming. You know, there, there are people with enough money, thanks to the SPACs like John talked about, that should be able to get over the hump, but we still haven't really done it, right? There's, there's not in the US a certified electric airplane yet, much less a, a certified electric VTOL aircraft. So I, I think we've gotta, gotta knock that down uh, to, to really then be able to start working on the next steps beyond that. All right, well, thank you, uh, panel. Before we uh, close for tonight, I would like to give you guys a token of our appreciation. Um, I don't think it's over 40 bucks. So I don't think you have to claim it on your uh, state. Uh, uh, and, and Michael, we'll make sure that uh, yours is mailed to you. Unless you're gonna be up here in Manassas anytime soon, I'll give it to you personally. Uh, so, I do want to thank everybody that participated on our panel. Uh, I, I think uh, they deserve a round of applause. I think they were excellent. <laughs> and before we call it a night, I would be remiss if I did not thank those people who were responsible for putting this thing together. Uh, I would like to thank Jolene Berry, who's my right-hand person. Raise your hand, Jolene. Uh, Patty Bieber back there keeps me straight as well. Uh, Richard Alaba is not here today. Uh, he is home with a brand new baby. Uh, and then uh, Brian Smith, our maintenance uh, supervisor. I don't see Brian, but uh, his crew put all this stuff together. And uh, last but not least, our intern, Matt. Raise your hand there. And uh, thank you for the company that is videotaping and providing this excellent uh, IT support. So I want to thank everybody. Have a great afternoon, I mean, evening, and be safe driving home. And I think we're going to be kind of around for a few minutes. So if you want to come up and ask a quick question, a quick question, uh, we'll be here for a few minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>